joyfully to God on the earth, sing the glory of His name, make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works, because of the greatness of your power. Your enemies will give faith and obedience to you. All the earth will worship you, will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. Come and see the works of God, who is also in the deeds towards the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land, and passed through the river on foot. Their letters rejoice in him. He rules by his mind forever. His eyes keep watch over the nations, but not the rebellious exalt themselves. A word that we can use to open up our time together to remind us of why we're here to worship, and also some, uh, some pretty on the nose specific mentions that we're going to get into in our sermon, uh, specifically in turning the sea into dry land and passing through the river on foot. We may have a, you may have an idea of what chapter and uh, what book going to be based on that. So, um, looking forward to our time together. But let's remember um, why we're here. Let's remember why we were woken up. Remember why we were created. The answer is all the same: to worship, and give adoration and praise to our King. Uh, a couple of things, and I'm going to be, uh, going to be very fast. Um, just, you can see most of it on your bulletin. Um, pretty, pretty standard week for us. Uh, we've had a good time, and just beginning our, our journey through the Galatians on Wednesday, um, we are still in the first chapter, so plenty of um, material left to go. Um, we're not going to try to rush through that book. Um, we're enjoying it so far, and once you know that you're, you're more than invited, uh, we hope to see you there on, on Wednesday. We have a great time, and that's uh, at 6 o'clock um, in the, the Hayes Fellowship uh, Hall. And then um, you might have gotten one of these little envelopes handed to you. You might see them up front. But Something to be praying about. Uh, we have the Andy Armstrong Easter offering. Um, there are a multitude of good, wholesome, um, God honoring offerings uh, throughout the year. And uh, I'm very, very proud that, um, that we are a church that puts like this one, that puts a high emphasis on it. Um, Lottie Moon and the, the Andy Armstrong Easter offering are two very worthwhile, very, uh, very good offerings to give to. There's all kinds of different ones out there. Some, you know, we may not take them. Um, put a lot of emphasis on, and, and that's okay. But the two that we want to really support are Lottie Moon and Danny Armstrong. And I cannot begin to tell you enough what those two offerings do for, um, for the Word of God spreading throughout the world, um, for supporting missionaries, um, specifically for us being Southern Baptists who are willing to get Southern Baptists on the mission field. Um, so I, I encourage us to begin uh, to continue thinking about that offering and praying for that offering and how we can get it, how we can support. And on top of that prayer, if you'll continue to lift our, our church up, um, I think this is a monumental year, truly a monumental year in terms of horrible, looking at the world, looking at our community, um, in, in, in terms of being missional, in terms of going uh, both near and, and this and far. And so I ask you to join me in those prayers um, for how we can support missionaries and how we can also support missionaries here. Um, so join me in that prayer. And Lastly, we want to give a uh, special belated birthday. We want to uh, remember Ms. Laura Martin. She passed by in 1996 and uh, thank you for her life. Thank you for that longevity. <laughs> good to have you with us, Laura. Your son, too. Um, always good, good to play with you and good to see you here. So, um,
squad I have. Can I borrow you for one second? Oh, I got my, I can't, he rolled his eyes at me. Come on up, guys. This will either be really good or real bad. Be right there. Um, Jack's had a birthday too. So, birthday boy over here. Um, all right, I'm going to give you a goal. Okay? And you got to reach an easy goal. This, this is not going to work at all. Okay, I do have money. Good. How much do I have? Two dollars. That's it. Just kidding. Um, all right, so here you go. Two dollars. Your goal is to walk over there and, and get that two dollars. Okay? Where are you going? Where are you going? I mean, so we're going to go get that two dollars now. Very much an overhead view of this event. I'm not going to go through 
detail for the sake of time, um, just so that we are caught up even in the slightest bit. This is the Exodus out of Egypt. This is God as he leads Moses, as Moses leads Israel out of Egypt. This is where Pharaoh is in pursuit, uh, begins pursuing Israel, begins getting his chariots and horses and soldiers and armies together. And uh, Moses is leading them out. And then we, of course, get to the event of the parting of the Red Sea, which we will cover uh, next week. So, so just join me in Exodus 13. This is what we're going to do. So, you know, Exodus 13, starting in verse 21. I'm going to read. So just if you got, if you got a flip or look over, I'm going to read all the way into Exodus 14, ending in verse 14. Okay? So, so just bear with me. We're going to walk through this. We're just simply going to read this story. Here's what the Lord God tells us. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now we're in chapter 14, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Piahiroth, between Migdal and Sea. You shall camp in front of, excuse me, you shall camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite by the sea. For Pharaoh will save the sons of Israel. They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will be honored. Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, What is this that we have done? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made his chariot ready, and took his people with him. And he took six hundred select chariots. And all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of all over, excuse me, over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel, as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all of the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them by camping by the sea, as at Piahiroth, in front of Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became frightened, so the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. We're going to stop there. We will get to, and we will cut in half. We'll get to the parting of the Red Sea um, next Sunday. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But in preparation for that, there's something, uh, I, should, I should say something, there's a lot of things happening in that preparation for that event. There's a lot that takes place in just this text that we've read this morning. A lot of very special things, a lot of very sorrowful things, but things that we need to pay attention to. And the first thing that I am really reminded of. For us as New Testament believers looking into the Old Testament and seeing all that points that is this coming covenant and all points to Christ, one thing that jumps off the page to me is a constant reminder that we are people who walk by faith and not by sight. Now you might be saying, how do you, how do you get to that point? Because look what Israel's doing. They're following a, a pillar, a cloud. This is one thing, by the way. The daytime is a cloud, the nighttime it has a, a flame, it has a light. It, it kind of shows them where to go. It's the manifestation of God and His power and His majesty and His might and His guidance. And it seems strange to be able to be reminded that we walk by faith and not by sight. And we just read about Israel who is walking by sight. There's a lot of people who might want to see this and read this. I think we're very guilty of doing this. 
ones will say, God, why have you not just shown me? Why have you not just shown me the path? It would be a lot easier if you would just guide me. And so we read this narrative and we might say, it would be great. It would be wonderful. It would be so much easier and better. And God, I need to be a better Christian. I would serve you better. If you would just manifest something in front of me and show me God's. If you would allow me to live by sight, it would actually be better. And what I'm telling you this morning is, newsflash, no it would not. There's a problem with us thinking that it would be better if we would just be shown that easy. And that problem is us. That problem is the human heart. That problem is the human condition. And you see that in who? In Israel. Did they not have sight? And yet, what did they do? Did they not see things that we do not see? And yet, what happened? We think that we would enjoy that type of physical manifestation before us. That it would be so much easier. Folks, it would only show more evidence of our depravity. It would only show more evidence of that, that wonderful song that we, we sing that hymn. It's talking so much about our our wandering heart. I'm my wandering heart to be prone to wander and what I feel. But guys, we, we feel this. We can have it dangling in front of us like a carrot. God Himself. And we will look in the other direction. We can have that cloud if we want it, but at the end of the day, we are still humans and we are still fallen humans. And we will find other things to take up our time. We will find things that are better. We will be like Israel and we will say, this does not make sense. We too are able and will be and would be people that if we had a cloud and pillar in front of us, beforehand it sounds great. And it would be great until that pillar takes us where we do not want to go. Until it puts us in a place of being uncomfortable. It all sounds so good. But the moment we start seeing it go to the side, to something scary out of our comfort zone, that's when we have that familiar feeling. I'm prone to wonder. I'm prone to turn away from God. The question I have for, for Israel and for us and for myself, you know the path they went on and they wandered in the wilderness. You know, the, the area of the land that was waiting for them. This promise that God had given to them. It took them how long? Did they, how long did they wander? Forty years. Do you know how long it would naturally take to get there by foot? How? It's no time. It's no time. It's nothing. You can make it. If you're going nonstop a week. If you're doing the camping thing, a couple weeks. If you're being lazy like me, maybe a month at most. That's constantly breaking, constantly breaking. It was right there. Do you know what would have happened to Israel if they had gone before that 40 years? There's a problem if they had gone early. There's this little um, death trap called the Philistines. Sure, fire, death. No different than me taking Jack and saying, come on. And just ushering in it right into my mind. Promising death. No different. And so in the meantime, there's the complaining. In the meantime, there's the hostility. Why? 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 Why, Why have you done this? They use their own vision. They're not trusting God's Vision. They complained, they were upset, they were angry, they distrusted Moses, they spoke ill of Moses. Not seeing God's vision. And it only gets worse for it gets better, but we will, we will get there. The second thing I want to point out from this is that we are a people. Marked by what lies ahead, not what lies behind us. Israel had this major problem, a big problem with this type of lifestyle. And I'm going to read again, and you can follow along with me starting in verse 10. I think we see it forefront in, in this verse, or set of verses. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. They became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? 
Why have you kept us this way and bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. We would rather die in desolation and far from home. We would rather serve Egypt and their false gods. We would rather serve something that is so foreign to us and yet has become our new home. We would rather serve that than be in the wilderness with the presence of God. It's essentially what they're saying. This is evidence of the human condition. We too are guilty of this same spirit. This same mindset. It's dead. Listen. All they care about, stick to what is familiar. And that's what's so ironic about this. Stripped from home in a foreign territory. But guess what? That life had become familiar to them. Because there was, even in danger and even in doing such kind of work, even in being slaves, it was familiar. They were so-called safe. As long as they put in the work, as long as they did, they were told they had safety. That's their new home. Not clinging to what God had promised. Not clinging to the promises of their fathers. But clinging to what was familiar, even if that familiarity was a bad thing. That is 100% human condition. If you don't think so much that that's true, ask yourself your struggles. Ask yourself what sins you have trouble shaking. Ask what is so easy to run back to. We live in a drug-infested community, right, here in Anderson. And if you talk to your neighbors, they will tell you they hate the drugs, they can't stand it, they hate the lifestyle, and yet, what they run to is familiar. You can't get enough of it. Each person in this room right now struggles with something. I don't care what it is. And when you are by yourself, you are a different person than when you are here. We all struggle with sin. And sometimes it is very, very easy for us to fall back to what we enjoy and what is familiar, even though it's bad, even though it's wrong, even though it is far from God, even though it is the direct opposite of His promises and clinging to His ways. There are times where we look at what we know and what is familiar and we choose it over discomfort with the abiding presence of God. It is what keeps us from performing his works that he said before us. It's what keeps us from taking part in joining him on his mission. We choose comfort over his presence. That's all we know to this pillar and say, you know, it'd be so much easier. You see it play out in Israel. It's not easier. In some ways, it's even more difficult. Because then we see a clear direction of where we want. And yet God has a better vision. He has his vision. But the excuse me, the third thing I want to point out, and moving fast, is that we are people who are marked by resting in God and his work. We are people marked by resting in God and his work. Verse 13. But Moses says to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Throughout all the scripture, we see this time and time and time again. We see countless times in which the battle is already over, the battle is already decided, and it does not belong to us. Many times we live to use examples like, what about David and Goliath? Listen, David did not stay alive. It's easy for us to put that work in his hands. God destroyed death that day. God destroyed death that day. You cannot do it in your own power. I cannot do it in my own power. Moses is talking to Israel and he says, Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which will, he will accomplish for you today. He goes back and know this truth already. This salvation is not of you and yourselves. It's not of me. I cannot do anything to save myself. I am helpless. I am alone. I'm stripped naked and 
held and exposed. I have nothing in terms of trying to earn my own salvation. I'm just a frigid little child, abandoned. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It is His to give. It is His deliverance that He offers and gives to us. It does not belong to our own hands. There's nothing we can do. And so what is the response? Be still. Be silent. The Lord fights before us. Is the Lord who accomplishes His will. We're involved in that process. We're a part of that process. But He is the one at work. He is the one who is the giver. I said a few times before, the only thing we add to our salvation is the sin that made necessary. I've heard that a million times. I think it's a wonderful quote. That's what we bring to the table. I find a wonderful parallel because so many times we try to take, take things into our, our own hands. So whether it be our own salvation, whether it be our works, a lot of times our works. God, I don't feel close to you. What can I do to, to bridge that? We, we rest in Him. We rest in Him. That's how we, we cling to His promises. We obey Him. A lot of times we feel like we're distant and we're not close to God. And then there's questions. What am I doing? Reading your Bible? No. Are you praying? No. Are you making disciples? No. And we wonder, why do I feel so distant from God? Because maybe we're disobedient. There's a wonderful parallel that I see in Scripture in terms of being still. And it attacks this idea that we are the ones on the offense. We are the ones going out and slaying our giants and battling our demons and taking things into our own hands. And it comes from Ephesians 6, famous passages, uh, famous set of texts we know and love. Talk about the armor of God. Let me just read that. It's Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. We get a lot of text this morning, but let me just read that. I just want you to pay attention to this. Just listen. Just pay attention to all the little details that come into play here. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his mind. So right off the bat, it's not our strength. Right off the bat, it's not our mind. It's his. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his mind. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm. Okay? You'll be able to stand firm, be able to take and take and take against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All of this armor, talking about battle. See, a lot of times we, we read that. And I grew up reading about the armor of God, and you know what I put into my mind? I'm getting suited up for a fight. And so I'm getting all this armor put on my entire body and get something put on my head. And look, there's going to be a sword. And so naturally, what does one do when they are armored this way? They have a sword. They go out and they, they swing around and they fight. 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 One weapon out of all of that material. One single offensive weapon. The truth of the matter is, if we're going to take this in a, in a more literal sense, I don't think we're going to have to swing that sword in the way that we usually think. That sword is the Word of God. He is the one that fights for us. All of that material, all of that armor, all of that defense. Not once do you see it in an explanation. Not once in Ephesians 6 do you see a command. Not once do you see it Telling Christians to go out and swing that sword, to go out and fight, to be on the offensive. And if you want to be serious, if you want to be honest, it says things like stand firm, things like resist. That's no accident. 
The armor of God is a defense mechanism. It is not something for us to get girded up so that we may go out and attack, attack, attack. It is something that we may rest in Him and understand and know that God is our refuge and our shield. We only need to be silent and still and believe and trust in what He is doing. You will see this put on display in an amazing fashion next Sunday. Because we know the story. We know what happens next. And there's so many intricate details that I, I can't fathom. I, we cannot skip over those. And so we'll, we'll split this in that. But for today, in our preparation, it is so very important for us to understand and to know God's ways are better than our ways. This is an old, traditional Southern Baptist sermon. His ways are so much better than ours. We think we know better. We think we know what is best. I am guilty of this more than anyone else. In the heart of transparency, I am bitter. I'm bitter with myself. I'm impatient. I think I know what's best. God has been working on my heart. I can testify this morning. God has been working on my heart and is continuing still this morning, right now, continuing to work on my heart to show me that His way is greater than mine. And as your appointed leader, it is deadly for me to have a faith that I have all the answers in my own strength. I must rely on Him. Will you join me in the doing the same for all of us? Will you join me in doing the same thing? And and asking God, show us and reveal your vision, not my own. Show to us and reveal what you want out of us specifically, not what we want. Not what Pastor wants, but God, what you want. Let us take this example from Exodus 14 to see that the Lord is the one who is preparing the way. To see that the Lord is the one who is showing a path. That we must be people willing and ready and excited to share his vision, not project at all. And that begins with me. So as we enter in and we think about these things, let's remember this as we leave and let's be excited next Sunday. Let's be excited about seeing what God does in this time of preparation. Let us also, as we close, take the time to repent. As I also must do. Because so many times we become the ones who grow. So many times I become the one who complains. Wouldn't it be better or easier if? One of the first things I'm more willing to come up with in my mind is that sense. Wouldn't it make more sense if, God? I do just as much, if not more, than anybody else. And for that, I must ask for forgiveness to my Lord and my Savior. As we leave, let's, let's remember all these things. Let's remember that we are to be people who take up the armor of God. To know that it is a defensive close attack. We are to hear ourselves. We are to rest in Him. We are to trust in Him. We are to admit and acknowledge and profess that His way is better. Let's close the prayer. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29, we read the following. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. He does not judge. The body of God to take this time as we distribute the bread and the juice. Take this time to repent. Take this time to ask and see and not ask the Father. Examine ourselves. Look deep inside ourselves. Ask what can we do for our own sanctification? What can we do to grow in holiness? What can we do to honor the Lord? More than anything, take this time to ask for correction. Father God, discipline us. Convict us. Show us our errors. Show us the ways of our errors. Shaking our hearts. Shaking our minds. 
received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 